I don't see Dr. Carol over here um, because I wanted to put her in the spotlight for a second just because um, since I uh, defended my dissertation in September, every time she saw me she would um, ask me, um, do, do, should she call me Brother Doctor or Dr. Brother? <laughs> <laughs> on for months and months and um, finally I just, um, I, I said um, that she could call me uh, Brock <laughs> I don't know if that might catch on with anyone else other than Carol, but uh, uh, this is the uh, title of my dissertation, for I can word, a case study in the relationship between creativity and spirituality. Um, here's my thesis. I propose that a major incentive for Fritz Eichenberg's voluntary artistic contributions to the Catholic worker was that it provided him a way when he could develop his artistic persona of the artist on the witness stand, an observer testifying against social injustices. Um, and then these are basically the various chapters of the dissertation. But uh, what I want to do today, not just to speak, um, present uh, the dissertation itself, although some of that will be intertwined with what I present about um, basically the process of writing uh, the dissertation and the process of research. Um, and I think, you know, with this audience, uh, that would be something of, of interest. And I think uh, there's a lot of different ways that I can take this, but I really thought talking about the process of research would be uh, interesting for, uh, for this audience. Um, and this is in some ways where it starts, and this is one of our Abbey Prayer books, and um, there is one of Fritz Eichenberg's uh, images um, at the bottom left, and I think it you know, occurred to me, um, you know, at some point, because I remember the days before the internet, but, uh, you know, seeing an image like this, that it occurred to me, I wonder who that artist is, and I think I could type in a few keywords and find out who that artist is. Um, so that's a little close up. And so, yeah, I typed in a few words uh, and I uh, found Fritz Eichenberg. Uh, so I was able to find the name of the artist and, uh, and the name of the image, Christ of the Bread Lines, by Fritz Eichenberg. Um, and uh, over time, here's a, a few images just to kind of show how widespread um, I can, this particular image by Eichenberg is. This is um, at an intentional community in Oakland that uh, you'll very commonly find this image on the walls of places. Um, uh, this is a Catholic worker house, Guadalupe house in Tacoma. Uh, that kind of turned out a little bit dark, but um, the Catholic worker newspaper that started, I think it was 1933 was the first year, um, and it was on sale for uh, one penny. But uh, even today, uh, you know, it's on the cover of the issues that they sell for one penny, and if you look inside, and if you were interested in a subscription, um, it's 25 cents a year. So I asked the abbot for a donation, more than 25 cents, um, to send to the Catholic worker to get a subscription, and uh, if you do that, you'll get this uh, kind of a postcard um, with her subscription. Um, there was a priest uh, of the Archdiocese of Seattle who actually uh, gave this to me. I uh, haven't uh, asked if he wants it back, but um, he uh, uh, took a copper plate and he carved it uh, with a nail. And when he found out I was doing this dissertation, uh, he gave that to me. Um, this is a, a mural mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. So it just kind of shows how widespread this image is that was done um, in the early 1950s. Um, so I had his name and I searched and found this book uh, that uh, is in our library, the Grady Library, and looking through this book, um, just really realized how much more of an artist he was than uh, his work for the Catholic Worker. So he was uh, a book illustrator. And so I was able to see um, some of his uh, book illustrations. I'd love to spend more time talking about these, but kind of just to progress into the research elements um, and kind of show um, some of the different kinds of book illustrations that he did. Um, he was a big fan of Dostoevsky novels and did um, a lot of uh, 
illustrations for Dostoevsky's novels. This is a pretty famous one of his image of from Wuthering Heights, um, Heathcliff under a tree. Um, so some of you might uh, recognize some of these images. Um, so what happened for me, um, is, as far as taking Fritz Eichenberg as a research topic, um, and you know, beyond an artist that I just thought was an amazing artist that I was interested in to the topic of my dissertation, was in my comprehensive exam, um, we had comprehensive exam papers to write, and we would submit four papers, or we would submit two papers that we had uh, previously written, and then we would propose two more papers that we would write. And I knew really what strategically what you would love to do is um, to have you, uh, your major final comprehensive exam paper um, as a stepping stone for your dissertation. So you can just kind of flow with a topic that you're researching intensively for your comprehensive exam paper um, right into your dissertation. And uh, at that time, I thought that I wanted to write about uh, Benedictine um, medieval uh, artist and musician um, Hildegard of Bingen. Um, and so I had been writing some papers about Hildegard of Bingen. Um, but I didn't really know this beforehand, it wasn't written anywhere, that uh, you, know, you don't want to double up in your comprehensive exam papers. So I was going to submit one of the papers that I had already written on Hildegard of Bingen and propose another paper. Um, and my advisor said, well, you know, we still want to show a little bit more breadth here and not to double up on, on a topic. So in a way, I was um, uh, scrambling a bit, um, just backing up again then. So I was studying at Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. Um, here's a picture of uh, the library there. And um, my area uh, is Christian spirituality. Um, and so Christian spirituality is contrasted with theology as um, spirituality really focusing on the experience of Christians, in contrast to theology, to put it simply, being about the beliefs of Christians. So, I, uh, my area is Christian spirituality with a, an allied field in art and religion. And um, this is, um, in a one-image nutshell, um, kind of the core of my theory, is a relationship between creativity and spirituality, and cases, looking at uh, uh, cases where creativity can enhance spirituality, spirituality can enhance creativity um, in ways that make it so that creativity and spirituality often seem um, indistinguishable, but ways also that um, creativity and spirituality can be odds at together that kind of show that they're not always the same thing as some scholars uh, will, will say. So this is basically the theory that I had. And so I had ways of applying this to Hildegard of Bingen that I uh, wanted to explore. Um, now I had to uh, find a different uh, case study to, to focus on. And I realized, um, to kind of cut right to the chase, I, I started thinking about Fritz Eichenberg which led me to um, see uh, what was available on Fritz Eichenberg. Um, I, I, I had seen his, some of his book illustrations, and I loved his illustrations, but I hadn't really actually read much about his life. I didn't, you know, if I like an artist's work, I don't always have to read about their life. Uh, but in this case, I wanted to see, okay, this could be a pot potential uh, research topic. What is out there on him? And one of the big things, uh, key things that I found was that the Smithsonian um, website on the Archives of American Art, they actually had interviews with uh, Fritz Eichenberg. Um, so three different interviews um, given at different times for the 1960s to 70s. And these interviews just gave me a huge amount of information uh, about Fritz Eichenberg. So, so that was the starting point for me to see what was there. Now I've gone back and I've seen they've uploaded the actual interviews. Um, and 
so he basically just talks about his life story, he talks about his career and things like that. So that gave me uh, a huge um, resource to work with. Um, and this will show one puzzle that I um, had to, to figure out and solve in the process. <clears throat> um, he says that uh, he began cartooning around 1927 or 28. He was born in 1901, so it was his um, 20s where he started a career um, as a cartoonist in Germany, um, working for Wolstein Publishers. Um, and he said that he was doing cartoons for, how do you pronounce that, uh, Isait Amita. What I soon discovered is um, uh, these are not real words. Um, these, um, you know, so you might think that this is German, I mean, you would assume that he's working in German for German newspapers. Um, so I was doing searches on these, and the only thing that would come up was this exact same website. So I thought, what, what is this newspaper? It's like nothing shows up. And I started to realize, yeah, okay, maybe these are not real words. Um, it's, a, it's an interview uh, with uh, an English speaker who then transcribes and the transcription can have happened several years later after the interview by someone else um, listening to an interview. I can't really follow up and say, you know, what? Can you repeat that? Can you spell it out? So they just basically spell it out. So I was um, wondering, what is that? Um, and she um, was uh, in conversation with a um, uh, sister um, at the Byzantine monastery who um, was German. And she um, told me the Izait, it, it could just be BZ. And that made me realize, oh, okay, BZ, um, that's a newspaper, the Berliner Zeitung. Um, so I had come across that, so I knew that much. Um, and then Amita, I, from there I realized, okay, that's um, Amita, basically the midday edition. So just kind of one little puzzle to, to figure out. and. Um, there are other puzzles to figure out because I was kind of really the first person to kind of go through and um, other people hadn't gone before me to figure things out that were puzzles um, just uh, like that. Um, there are a couple of other books that compile Fritz Eichenberg's art and tell some of his life. Um, this is called Works of Mercy. This has a lot of his illustrations for the Catholic worker, and it has essays um, from Dorothy Day, um, I think Jim Forrest, um, parts of, I think Eichenberg wrote something for this. Um, so it, it's not exactly a biography, it's not a scholarly edition in any way, um, but it's a collection of his work, and it's a useful re uh, resource for that. Um, here's another book that is a compilation of his work. Okay, there's the cover. Um, and so this is another um, uh, compilation of his work that was helpful. And I think it was basically enough. Um, here's kind of uh, a quick overview then. Putting this together from the website uh, on Smithsonian, from his interviews, um, and other sources there that he was born in Cologne, Germany in 1901. Um, he went to study at Leipzig. Uh, was married in the 1920s, um, and had a daughter born. Um, they fled uh, Nazi Germany um, in 1933. Um, so he was born um, and describes uh, his uh, Jewish family as uh, non-practicing, um, always part of the culture, but really um, very limited, um, even home practices. Um, I think his grandfather you know, would still um, observe some of the practices in the home, um, but uh, mostly he kind of he continues to insist that he saw himself um, as German uh, more than Jewish. In any case, he realized the threat very early and fled with his family and was able to do that um, because of being uh, an illustrator. He made a trip to the U.S., um, made connections, um, returned to Germany, um, and brought his family to the U.S. Um, tragically, within a few years, his wife died within a few days of being taken to the hospital of an uh, ovarian abscess. And um, 
So this put him into um, a very, very serious depression. Um, so he was basically kind of bedridden for, for probably weeks. Um, and kind of a spiritual crisis that led him to become uh, a Quaker, a uh, member of the Society of Friends in 1940, and then met Dorothy Day um, in 1949 at a conference. So it gave me enough material then to say, uh, I can write a comprehensive exam paper on Fritz Eichenberg. Um, so I would propose the comprehensive exams in March 2014, write, come back over uh, to St. Martin's over the summer and write the exams, and defend the exams in October. So the other thing that was happening at that time was um, I was in Berkeley. Uh, and realized I didn't, I, I felt ready to be in a different place. I had originally thought about possibly going to uh, St. John's in Collegeville, St. John's Abbey in Collegeville, Minnesota, as a place to write my dissertation. Um, and then I realized uh, I wanted to, um, you know, I, I needed more information than the interviews if I was going to do a dissertation on Eichenberg. So I was looking, what else is there on Eichenberg? And I found that um, the Catholic Worker Archives are, are at Marquette and um, showed that there were some materials on Eichenberg at the Catholic Worker Archives. So I did a search for Fritz Eichenberg Archives. So I was looking for his archives and it uh, led me to the Catholic Worker this is kind of a list of different Catholic worker themed archives out there. The top one being the one at Marquette University. Um, so you go in there and it shows an idea and then this is probably too small for you to read but that's okay. As you might. It just basically lists the different series of collections. Um, it's Dorothy Day's paper and Catholic worker archives. And then one of these is um, her private correspondence. Um, she was corresponding with Thomas Merton, uh, Daniel and Philip Berrigan, Catherine uh, Doherty, and others. Um, she was corresponding with um, bishops, archbishops, cardinals um, as well. Uh, and so there is uh, a series in a box and basically two folders with material um, from Fritz Eichenberg. So I thought, okay, um, now I started thinking about being um, in Milwaukee, where I could be close to um, the uh, archives there. Uh, let me just comment briefly on, you know, why are the Catholic Worker Archives at Marquette? <coughs> a curious question. I would have kind of assumed they might have been in New York, where the first Catholic Worker House uh, was founded and where Dorothy Day spent uh, most of her adult life. Marquette um, has this Catholic Social Action uh, Collection, which includes the Catholic Worker and also um, Catholic Association for International Peace, National Catholic Conference for Interracial Justice, National Catholic Rural Life Conference. Um, yes, yeah, so some interesting other things. Um, Women's Ordination Conference. Are there, these are other archives that are at Marquette as well. And that's what brings the Catholic Worker Archives there. A lot of you are, to a greater or lesser degree, at least somewhat familiar with Dorothy Day um, as the uh, co-founder of the Catholic Worker with Peter Morin. I won't, don't want to spend too much time um, talking about her you know, vast, fascinating life, but um, just, I guess, one measure of her uh, influence is that uh, when Pope Francis um, came to the U.S. Uh, last year, two years ago, um, to speak to Congress, um, he mentioned four Americans as kind of models of faith. Um, yeah, chime in if you know who those four are. Um, Marky, Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton. Who's the fourth one? I think you. I think yeah. I think um, we've said them all. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Okay, that's uh, the other one. 
um, Thomas Merton and Dorothy Day. So just to kind of show um, the influence that she had um, on Catholic life. It was very much an advocate for economic justice, for the Catholic worker houses or houses of hospitality, that he would host people and also uh, provide meals. Very much uh, protested, um, very much a pacifist, a very strict pacifist. With all of this, I ended up arranging um, them to stay uh, at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. Um, and part of that I, uh, was I realized in the process on um, if I, I wanted to be, I wanted to see the Catholic World <coughs> uh, at Marquette, but I didn't necessarily need to be in Milwaukee to go into the archives every day. But I think what I realized is that what I do need kind of like every day is at least a, a library that's going to be comparable to the library at um, University of California, Berkeley. So being at Graduate Theological Union, it's a separate institution, but we do have an affiliation where we're able to use University of California, Berkeley libraries, and um, I just got spoiled in the time there. So I knew that I could just go in and find what I was just looking for, find rare things. And so I realized, um, being in Chicago, um, Catholic Theological Union is in Hyde Park. So uh, I knew that I could have access to University of Chicago libraries as well, which would be something that I would need more on a regular basis than the archives at Marquette. So um, downtown is um, up at the top, Hyde Park there. It's about six miles south of downtown. Um, there you kind of see the neighborhood of where University of Chicago is, um, and so uh, I was on the ninth floor of the residence hall there. Um, this is my a view looking north. You can see a little bit of downtown through the buildings there and a little bit of Lake Michigan to the, uh, so there with the little marker showing where we are at, it's just a couple blocks from the lake, um, which is just really great to be there on um, a night view. Um, and, uh, you know, Chicago's lucky. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. um, so, my plan then was in Chicago to, uh, to then go uh, to defend my conference exams in October, and, uh, and then I was in Chicago for 2014, 2015 academic year. Um, and come back to Chicago and work on the dissertation proposal. And once the proposal is in, I'll be able to come back to St. Martin's and, and write it. Okay? So just trying to get as much research done in that year. So when I was in Chicago, then um, I made um, trips up to Milwaukee and um, uh, have a, a Jesuit friend who uh, was kind enough to host me at the Jesuit community. Um, uh, which is right across from the library. Um, so that was just a really great thing to have. And made uh, three different trips, just a couple days each, to the Catholic Worker Archives. And there was, you know, there's really only two folders. Uh, so there wasn't actually that much to go through. I came across some of the correspondence. Um, and I would always take a photo of um, uh, the f uh, folder I was looking through and then take pictures. So when I went back, I would uh, I had a system of, okay, what photos came from which folder. But uh, someone um, there uh, was a dissertation written on Eichenberg in 2002, um, and I did get in contact with uh, the uh, author of that dissertation, who's a priest um, uh, in Ohio, and got his uh, dissertation at came and he had this incredible resource that I didn't quite realize at the beginning that like I need this resource if I'm going to write about Eichenberg's um, illustrations for a Catholic worker I really need a pretty detailed inventory of um, all the work that he did for the Catholic worker that comes out I think maybe five times a year it's an odd it's not every uh, maybe it's bi-monthly, um, but um, maybe six um, issues a year for, um, 
I think, 40 years worth of um, illustrations. So there was a lot to go through, and that's what this author did, was to go through um, each image um, or each issue and record every time there's a Fritz Eichenberg image. And some of those, if I were to go through, it might have been, it would have taken a lot of work to identify, you know, which ones were Eichenbergs, and you know, there would be some that I wouldn't be quite sure just by looking at it they were done by Eichenberg. Um, and some uh, images like Christ of the Breadlines appear numerous times um, in numerous different issues. Um, and so he went through all that. So I had that, and um, of course they do have all the back issues, um, physical copies. A lot of libraries um, will have microfilm just because they're printed on newspaper, and even the ones I was looking at, they're um, deteriorating. Um, but so I went through and basically got my own pictures uh, just to kind of give an idea of what was happening um, at the time. And that's really what his dissertation has to do with is, you know, why did the editors of the Catholic Worker put Eichenberg's <clears throat> images next to these particular articles? Was there a thematic connection there? Um, <clears throat> so um, this is actually his image <clears throat> of uh, St. Benedict. And so what happened then, um, as another big thing that happened at Marquette, I was talking to a um, reference librarian, and um, I yeah, yeah, I was at Marquette, I was looking through the materials there, really helpful, but I thought his own archives have to be somewhere. At some point, maybe I'll contact the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn where he taught and ask them, ask someone there, because uh, I searched and I didn't, I couldn't find, I had searched for Fritz Eichenberg's archives, came up with the Catholic Worker archive. Reference librarian took uh, five seconds and typed in Fritz Eichenberg papers. And then it took maybe a fraction of a second to come up with um, his paper, which were so um, at Yale. And so just exposed me to uh, the website here that is a guide to the <coughs> Eichenberg's papers at Yale. Catholic Worker Archives had basically two folders and the dissertation and, and the back issues. Uh, but Yale had basically 72 boxes of <laughs> um, uh, material. Going through this, I realized I didn't have to go through all of them. Um, that's okay. Um, uh, but this was also really helpful just to have this um, to see what was there. And it, it would give you an idea. It would uh, list in a box and the number of the folder in the box and some idea of what was in the box. So again, that was really helpful. And they had a system where you could you couldn't really just go and browse through these boxes. You had to request like five boxes a day. And as soon as you turn in a box, you could check it out another one. So there were some things there. <clears throat> that was part of Yale's collection of the arts of the book. Just some comments about uh, a camera that I was using because you might be familiar, just don't want to spend too much time on this, but that uh, the two major categories of cameras are like point-and-shoots or DSLRs as far as digital cameras. Um, point-and-shoots are least expensive compared to more expensive, portable, um, large, heavy. Um, but see, a point-and-shoot is going to be difficult to get <coughs> images in the light. And when you're in the archives, you know, obviously um, you can't use flash. Um, and that's due my learning is a lot because uh, a point-and-shoot you can't change the lens which is what you do with a DSLR but within I don't know maybe the last 10 or 15 years there's a new category of camera that's kind of like middle price range medium size um, better than point-and-shoot as far as taking images in low light and that's because um, these mirrorless cameras you can also change the lens so I was basically using that kind of camera um, always Fascinating to talk about photography with anyone else who's really into it as well. Um, so uh, I 
back and I asked Abbott Neal, Kurt Eichenberg's papers are in Yale. I need to make a trip to New Haven um, from Chicago. So um, a little bit closer than, uh, than if I was in Berkeley. Uh, I took an Amtrak train and uh, caught a picture of New York City on the way um, uh, from the elevator tracks uh, over Queens. And you know, and I was looking at um, religious communities to stay at, and uh, finally it occurred to me, well, you know, I was looking at Jesuit communities, Benedictines, um, and I thought, you know what, I'll see if there's a, a Catholic worker community there. So I was able to stay um, at a Catholic worker community which also gave me um, the experience then of, of being in the community, uh, eating with uh, the, the people who came uh, for meals. I think they were serving uh, breakfast every day and a lunch. I wouldn't come, um, I was in the archives during the day, so I wouldn't be there for lunch. But yeah, just really, really gracious hosts and a great experience to be there and just arranged to be there for um, close to two weeks um, to spend about nine days in the archives there. And that was interesting to see. It kind of makes sense that the original letters from Fritz Eichenberg to Dorothy Day were at Marquette. The original letters from Dorothy Day to Fritz Eichenberg were at Yale. And so it kind of makes sense that, you know, you're sending letters to someone and they're among their things when they pass away and then they go into their own archives. So um, that was interesting to see and that made me realize, you know, other letters that I would see at the archives um, at Yale would be letters that Fritz Eichenberg received from Dorothy Day and other people, and then the letters that Fritz Eichenberg sent to other people, his own writings, which I would be also interested in, or around the world to you know whoever he was corresponding with, and um, some people may have thrown them away, or when they died, their relatives um, may have thrown them away, or maybe they kept them, so that's kind of the next step of kind of a process of, you know, where are the letters that Eichenberg wrote to other people? This then is uh, a letter from Fritz Eichenberg to Dorothy Day at Marquette. They met in 1949, and um, this is uh, the first letter from Eichenberg to Dorothy Day, saying that after they met, um, I think it was in January, uh, the reason why I didn't deliver what I promised, because she recounts later that uh, she immediately asked if he would do illustrations for the Catholic order. So he replies to her um, in the letter that it's something that he is eager to do, but is prevented by his health. He's been sick uh, off and on with the virus since Pendle Hill and have not been able to function properly. But while lying on my back, I have been making sketches, which I am eager to show you and have read the Catholic worker with great <coughs> interest and admiration. Um, this is a letter then from Dorothy Day to Eichenberg, <coughs> later, saying um, Peter Morin, co-founder of the Catholic worker, um, died Sunday. It was very Wednesday and Thursday. Your beautiful gift came. I sat and wept over it. I was so moved with joy. So, just basically receiving uh, his illustrations um, right around that time. And that uh, they'll be included in the next issue in which they write with Peter. They're uh, exactly right. How can we ever express our gratitude? The others feel the same. Um, and then here then are just a few more images. Some of the method that I use for kind of keeping track of what I have, what I've lived through. And that basically kind of summarizes and uh, didn't I wanted to leave at least a little bit of time just uh, for questions.